think it's on. OK, so that introduction was a little bit misleading. I'm going to really focus today on the development of a single idea. And I think it's important to take a look at this journey uh, that we took with one of the companies, Powerflower Solar, to get an idea of the challenges that face an idea as you try to bring it into the world. And I'm not here to tell you the story to, to borrow the words of Reverend Howard, to awe you with our expertise. Because while I was applying my education, I was learning a whole lot more uh, in the process, M but more to inspire you to keep going and to sort of work through the different challenges that you're going to face. Because so this bringing ideas into the world is not an easy task, as I'm sure many of you have realized. But let's get right into it, and we'll jump to the beginning of the story of the development of the idea behind Powerflower Solar. This whole thing started about six years ago in my family's small vineyard. It's a place that I spent a lot of time when I was younger working and getting to know this environment. But what makes it important to our story today is that it's the location where I got that initial moment of inspiration that eventually led to the development of a concept and a product and then a company. And that inspiration was when two seemingly unrelated things came together in the back of my head and got stuck there. It wasn't a sort of divine event. There was no muse. And those two, first of those things was an event. Uh, my family had just installed a new building. And we wanted to power it with solar panels. It was located remote from the grid, so this made sense financially. But we ran into a problem. We couldn't put solar panels on the rooftop because the building was back in the woods and it was shaded. And we couldn't put them out over the plants because, well, the plants needed the sun. And we couldn't put them in the empty part of our field because we planned to fill it in the near future. So there we were as farmers, people who already harvested the sun, unable to put solar panels on our land when it was the right financial thing to do. That was incredibly frustrating. And I think we all get these little frustrations in our lives. And often, that's where ideas come from. But that's not enough getting those frustrations. There has to be something else. And I had a lot of time to think about this frustration as I spent time working on the farm. Did a lot of sort of repetitive manual things and had a lot of time to let my mind wander. And one day, when my mind wandered back to this frustration, I realized I was staring at nature's elegant solution to this problem of harvesting the sun. The leaf, right? And then I had it, what I'll admit to you today was a very unoriginal thought. I thought to myself, what if we could make solar panels more like leaves? OK, right? <laughs> that had been thought before. That wasn't anything crazy or anything new. Then it got a little bit interesting, and I thought, OK, I combined that age old question with that frustration, and I thought, what if we could make solar panels more like leaves so that they could better fit the farm environment? OK, you know, that, that was an interesting question, I thought, but I had no idea what to do with it at the time. I mean, I, I was in high school, and I didn't really have the skills that I, I needed to even begin to address it. So I let that idea sit in the back of my mind for the next two years until I found myself here at the University of Pennsylvania, beginning to learn the tools that I would need to actually address this problem. And then one night, it seemed like those new tools met up with this old inspiration somewhere in the back of my head, and an idea came out. And it came to me in the form of an image. And this is a dramatic recreation of the first sketch. Yeah, this was awesome, right? This, was, this came to me, I was distracted from homework, and all of a sudden, this thing showed up. And the idea was simple, right? Instead of using a, a stationary permanent solar panel, we could have a solar device with a deployable mirror that focused sunlight onto very small solar cells. And I thought, wow, this innovation thing is easy. In just 20 minutes, I had revolutionized the solar industry. <laughs> but I, I wanted to check, so I went to Google to prove myself right. I figured 99% sure that I could you know, leave school, patent this baby, and just ride that for the rest of my life. So I went to Google, and I typed in a few keywords related to this, and I hit search. Uh, and in about 0.003 seconds, uh, my dreams were crushed. <laughs> and I was presented with about 100,000 different reasons uh, why I wasn't nearly as clever as I had thought. It turns out there was a 25-year-old industry sitting behind this idea of focusing sunlight onto solar cells. Ah, crap. <laughs> so I had a choice, right? I could walk away, or I could keep going and, and fight on with this idea. And I walked away. I didn't, you know, it seemed like a daydream and not an interesting one at that. But I couldn't help but come back to it later. My curiosity got the best of me, and I still wasn't putting in a good, you know, a huge amount of time in developing this thing. It was something I found myself wandering back to. I took it one step further from this initial sketch, and I imagined a solar device that was closed at night and opened up in the morning. And these are the original storyboards from way, way, way back. Opened in the morning, tracked the sun producing energy throughout the day, uh, and closing at night. And it was in doing this process of going through the, the steps of how it would work that I started to ask the really important question of why. You know, why had I come up with this idea that was the way that it was? Obviously, it started somewhere in my head, and there must have been a reason for it, but I didn't know. And when I showed this to people, they said, OK, you know, that's wonderful. It's new, but why is it new? Hmm. 
So I began to think about that. You know, I should know the answer to this, right? I mean, it's obviously in my head somewhere. But it took me some time to realize that the answer came from that initial inspiration of making solar better for farms. And I realized that because this device can open and close, it could be integrated in with active crops. And because it can open and close, it could be easily moved and rotated as field use changed. And because it could open and close, it could protect itself from the rigors of the farm environment. Hmm. So what I had here was an idea for a solar generator for farmers. And at that point, I kind of just let my imagination run. Right? I didn't have any plans, but I was developing these new tools. And one of them was you know, solid modeling, right? taking ideas and putting them into 3D on the computer, which I thought was excellent. And I often practiced this skill on this idea that I had. And then you know, I, I created this thing. Uh, and this, this later went on to become the power flower. But right now, it was just this you know, portable solar generator for farmers. And to be honest, this is a lot of you know, paper mache. right? This is a, a nice rendering, but there isn't you know, really that much there. But it inspired me. And everywhere I went, I saw fields filled up with these things. Um, <laughs> and that was a little bit distracting while I was trying to drive. Um, <laughs> so, so I saw them everywhere, and I had this vision of how they could change agriculture and how they could change the world. And I had this starting off point, this idea for a generator, but I had no idea how to go from point A to point B. And I found my answer actually right here at the University of Pennsylvania uh, with the Weiss Tech House. The programs at the Weiss Tech House encouraged me to do this, this thing, to develop this new idea, when otherwise I might have prioritized you know, my homework uh, over, over it. So they encouraged me, and they provided a little bit of funding at this early point in the project that was incredibly important. I took it one step further, and I brought the idea into the world, and I pitched to a room full of people like this, this idea of a portable solar generator. And the response was incredibly positive, and that was very inspiring. And a funny thing happened when this idea uh, hit the world. It went from being my idea to being our idea, and the team grew from just me to three. Tom and Ukraina and Patrick Murphy both made their own decision to dedicate their time and energy to this project, to this idea that had started so many years ago on the farm. But we were the core team, um, you know, putting the most effort and personal risk into this thing. But there was a whole group of other people, of, of supporting characters, that made this possible, and we couldn't be here without them. There were students who helped us you know, in different classes on the business and technical side. There were our friends, advisors, and professors who encouraged us and drilled us to make sure that we got this thing right. There were different organizations like the Weiss Tech House, like Wharton Entrepreneurial Programs, and the Kairos Society that encouraged us to just go out and do something, and do it well, and create new things. Of course, there were our families who funded us with very, very favorable loans at the very beginning. And even now, our parents who let us live in their houses and drive their cars to keep our expenses low. Um, so what basically what I'm trying to say is to everybody who's helped us, thank you. And um, we couldn't have been here without that help. OK, back to the story. We had our team, and now we had a goal. We were going to start a company. We were going to create a business around this idea uh, that was, I think we called it like the photon back then, but it later turned into the power flower. So we had this beautiful idea. And we wanted to start a company, but you can't sell an idea, we quickly learned. You need a product. So then we started on this a year-long task of taking this concept and turning it into a functioning device. And we did that over the course of about six months with a team of engineers uh, through our senior design project. And we went from this you know, collection of interesting insights to a collection of uh, technical systems that just about got it right. And the most fun part of this was the last month where we basically lived and literally lived and worked in the labs, bringing this thing into the world. And it was just incredibly exciting as the person who had come up with that first thing of inspiration to see this thing becoming so very real and seeing so many people motivated to complete it. So at the end of that process, we had a prototype. And it wasn't perfect. It didn't do everything that we needed it to do. But what was important is that we did it. And we went through the steps. And we had something to work off of. So it's the first iteration. And now we've moved on to bigger and better things. But this was an important step, the first time that we truly understood the technical systems and the challenges that we would need to face to bring this thing into the world. Now, while we were prototyping on the hardware side of things, we are also doing some prototyping on the business side as well. Our first business plan, put quite simply, would revolutionize agriculture and the solar industry. And all we needed was about $2 billion of investment. <laughs> but don't worry, because we could definitely give you a 10x return. Uh, so that one didn't work out. Uh, and we scaled back the ambition of that. And we found something really uh, important in this idea of bringing solar to farmers. And we found a better way to do that. And as we developed this device, we realized it was unique in the world of solar. Because it was developed for such a specific application, it had a unique set of attributes that made it apply across different markets. We imagined it as a beautiful solar device for consumers. 
and an extremely mobile solar device for the military and disaster relief agencies. And I don't think anybody ever doubted our vision and ever doubted these opportunities, but we had a problem. What we were doing was unique. And it became evident when we tried to pitch this to people who were savvy in the solar industry exactly what our problem was going to be. We would explain to them this idea, and they would say to us, OK, but what are you doing to make solar cheaper? And we would say, well, we're not. We're using existing technology. It'll be cost competitive, but we're focusing on making it more usable for our customers and therefore more valuable. And they would say, yeah, yeah, that's nice, but what are you doing to make it cheaper? So there was this focus, and there still is in the industry, and it's incredibly important because the technology isn't there yet, on this dollars per watt metric. But we are concerned about the other things that make people want to buy solar and make people actually want to put these things you know, on their lawns, on their houses, on their land, and make it part of their lives. But we became you know, characterized as those naive kids who thought customers cared about anything but this pure metric. We got the same dismissive attitude on the, side of, on the investor side. They loved the vision, but they didn't see it happening today. It would be, you know, 10 years out, come back to us after somebody else has proven that this would work. OK, that's a nice way to say, please get out of my office, I think. <laughs> so at the end of that year, we had our prototype and understood the technical challenges. And we had a good understanding of what we would have to do on the business side of things to make this work. And to be quite honest, it was kind of a bleak picture. We needed about a million dollars to get this thing to, you know, ready for production and more beyond that to scale up. And you know, we had received an only like, a lukewarm reception. So then we were faced with this choice, right? Do we stick with it or do we walk away? And it, this happens so much in the course of an idea. And ideas are so fragile. And all the, you know, what you really want to do is say, I'm smart enough to walk away, right? The rational person here judging all of these things would just pack up and leave and move on. And one of our teammates did that. Tommy went to get a real job. And I can't blame him for that because I was right there with him. After four years of work on this thing, you know, we were still hitting a wall. And I was getting tired of trying to prove everybody else wrong. But we didn't quit that day uh, because Pat insisted that we go on. And he said, let's give it a shot for the summer. Let's see what we can do. And to be honest, I, I, you know, that worked, right? And, but it wasn't because I necessarily truly believed at that point. I was really having a crisis of motivation. But it was because, well, I'll show you an example. So this is our most recent team picture that we use uh, when we pitch. It's us in the prototype out in the field, right? It's kind of nice. Um, but this, maybe? Yeah, this could have been our first. So that's me on the top and, and Pat you know, right, right below me. And we've been friends for a long time. So he asked me as a friend, stick with this project just a little bit longer. And it was that friendship that saved the power flower from us walking away from it. So OK, Pat also had a plan. He said, what, you know, let's not go back to those investors that we have been talking to. Let's go back to where this all started, to the farmers, and present them with what we've been doing, you know, this new prototype. And the response that we got was very, very exciting. They loved this thing, and they understood the value of it. And that got me back into the project in a big way. Now I was re-motivated, ready to go, but we were still hitting the same walls with investors. They still loved the vision, but didn't think it could happen. So then we got our lucky break. And all of this, all of this effort, and all of these decisions to stick with it came down to this one chance meeting. But we got there because we, you know, by that point, we were still in the game. So this was a meeting at our local farmer's market. I was talking to Al. And Al was somebody who I had known for years. I worked there when I was younger, and I had sold him vegetables in the past. I was telling Al about what we were doing. And he said, I might be able to help you out. It turns out he was the assistant secretary of agriculture in the state of New Jersey. Hmm. Wow. Lucky me. <laughs> <laughs> so he understood what we were trying to do. And he really, really liked the idea. And he got us in touch with. Nancy in the Office of Economic Development, who got us in touch with another group, the Commission on Science and Technology for the state of New Jersey. And we sat down with them, and they pitched us on all the excellent opportunities that they had for clean tech companies in the state. And one of them in particular, the Edison Innovation Clean Tech R&D Fund grant. Hmm. It was a $500,000 grant to, develop for, to cover research and development, that dirty word that investors didn't want anything to do with. It was perfect for us, and it would take a significant amount of the risk out of the project. But there was a catch. Uh, and that catch was that the application was due in a week. Okay, <laughs> And if that wasn't bad enough, we had to raise $250,000 of matching funds by that day. So we had been trying to raise money forever. And now all of a sudden, we had a, a week deadline. We said thanks, uh, and, and we left. And on the car ride home, we decided to throw a Hail Mary. We scheduled a meeting with an investor who had been following the project in New York City under the guise of giving him a routine update. And during that update, we mentioned 
how disappointed we were that we couldn't apply for this grant uh, at this stage. And he said something that we had hoped for but we didn't expect. He said, great, let's do it. Oh, okay. <laughs> so if we could write the application in the remaining now three days, it's about an 80-page application, <laughs> he would put up the money. Oh, well, you know, we, we had just come off of being students, so this, you know, working all night, all day thing was totally normal for us. <laughs> so we did this application uh, in three days, and we got it in. We were so close to the deadline that we had to hand deliver it to the office, and we were praying that we wouldn't hit any traffic on the drive up to Trenton. We got it in, though. Uh, and then all we did, you know, then we had to wait, and wait, and wait some more. And it was by, you know, this was in September, and by December we finally got a letter that said, congratulations. You've been selected to pitch for the final consideration for this grant. Wow, OK. And this was, at this point, we knew this was it, right? We had tried our hardest, and we realized that if we didn't get this grant, we were going to have to pack it in. This was now you know, do or die. And we, gave in, we came in, and we gave a great pitch, probably the best one of our lives. And we felt good, but still we had to wait. And all we heard were rumors of budget cuts within the government. We got nervous, and we waited some more. And then, one day, about four months after that, I was sitting in the Weiss Tech House listening to a talk, and I turned and I saw Pat knocking at the door. This was strange, because Pat was living in New Jersey at the time, and he didn't usually just show up. Uh, so I thought it was either really good news or really bad news. And it was that day that I learned that after all those years of hard work from that moment where these two seemingly unrelated things came together in the back of my head, that we finally had the resources that we need to prove that we could change the world with this idea, to prove that we could do it. We had gotten this grant. And that was an incredible moment. But there were so many times before that that we could have given up and could have walked away. So I want to leave today with a message to any of you who are thinking about walking away from an idea. Well, don't do it. I guess would be the quick version. <laughs> but, <laughs> but if you want a little bit more, more uh, you know, depth into that, you know, think about it. And think really hard about whether this is the time where you should walk away or if you just are trying to want to walk away because it's the easy thing to do. Because you, know, you have to take risks risks to develop new ideas and to create change. And sometimes it's worth it. So please, you know, keep going, keep developing things, and don't stop. Thank you very much for your time.